Morning. Um, you know, some, some things never, never change. When I was a kid playing sports, it didn't matter how long I played. Five minutes before the game, I would be pacing up and down in front of the bench. And then when the game starts, everything kind of chills. Well, even though I was sitting there in that chair, in my heart, I was pacing up and down in front of this uh, stage here because I don't know what it is. It's a personality flaw. You know what I mean? I can't help it. And then the minute I get up here, some, somebody asked me that recently. They said, you get nervous when you preach. And I said, right up until I stand up there. But when I'm sitting there waiting for him to, you know, pray, my heart starts going boom, 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 like this. But it's really exciting uh, to study these uh, messages because every time you do, even if you preach something over and over or if you read something over and over, the Lord always has a new thing for you. And this time it was getting to the point where I had to stop studying because the information just kept coming like a volcano erupting. And, uh, you know, I finally got to the point, I said, Lord, what do I do with all this? And he said, you do this. So I had to stop because uh, there was just more and more. So uh, if you open your Bible to Genesis 13, we're going to talk about Abraham. Uh, Abraham is one of my favorite people in the Bible, and, and the number one reason for that is because if you trace Abraham's life, you will see every Christian's walk, uh, some more than others. You know, some people don't seem to mess up as much. Uh, I personally did. Uh, I consider myself, when I got saved, and most people that, that were around me back then, I was a spoiled brat Christian. God was blessing me more than... You're not supposed to get emotional in the beginning of the message. <laughs> uh, he was blessing me more than I could handle. And, um, and the problem is I didn't handle it very well. And at the time, the only thing I knew to do was to repent and make it right and try to move on. But in hindsight, uh, I can read Abraham's life and I can see such a similar pattern. I was like, oh my goodness, that was me. Understand, the first time I read the Old Testament, I used to say, what's wrong with these people? What, are they crazy? I mean, God's blessing them, and they're turning their back on them. And what's the problem? You know what I mean? I think about the third time I read it through, I started seeing that there was this, oh, my goodness, I could put myself right there, and I'm doing the same thing. And see, because Christianity is a learning, growing process. I mean, we just don't get saved and get it all at once, you know what I mean? And we need to be, if you've been saved a long time, we need to be patient with people that are not saved a long time and they don't know. Um, at the place I work at, we have certain people that forget where they came from. And when someone asks them for, for help, they don't just say no, they get angry because someone's bothering them. And I said to this one guy, I said, you know, what did you have a dream one night and you woke up and you had all this knowledge? I mean, you gotta be kidding me. Every person in any trade relied on somebody at one time to help them through, you know what I mean? And so I always ask the Lord to help me to remember when everything was brand new. So when someone might come and ask me the same question over and over again, I don't get impatient and say, you know, why, don't you get it by now? I mean, you've been saved three months, you know? Um, it's very exciting and it's very painful to go back and, and read these things. And so what I decided to do this time, I preached about Abraham before, was to go back and find out where he came from. Because sometimes you can read a story in the Bible and it doesn't give you a good idea of the time frame or the circumstances that are involved. Why was this so hard for this guy? I mean, God said, hey, Abraham, we want, you know, I want you to get up out of your country, and I want you to go to a place I'm going to show you, and I'm going to bless the living daylights out of you. Wouldn't you think if the living God of heaven appeared to you and said, if you just do this one thing, I'm going to bless you, wouldn't you think he would just get it all right the first time? Well, sure, I'll go. Boom, right? It just, but it just doesn't work that way. In every person's life, there are circumstances, there's something that's going to hold you back, and in this particular case, God knew what those things, well, in every case, but in this case, God was trying to tell Abraham what to do to make this easier on, on him, and he wasn't getting it right away. He didn't start off being totally obedient. Now, 
just so you understand where he came from, the Bible says he's from Ur of the Chaldees. Now, whatever comes to your mind when you think of that, the first five times I read that, I thought this rocky desert place that, you know, they had to dig wells to, to get the water and probably 30,000 people came to the same place to get this one uh, source of water. That's not the case. Um, I wrote down a bunch of things here. I don't know how much I'll, I'll get into, but um, back in October 26, 1922, this guy, Professor Leonard Woolley, was told to go research Ur of the Chaldees. And he started digging and he started discovering what kind of a lifestyle that was. And believe it or not, it was a very civilized lifestyle. Now, what is the time frame? Well, the first 10 chapters of Genesis cover 2,000 years. From Genesis chapter 11 until the birth of Christ is the next 2,000 years. Okay? So any ideas about evolution? Cavemen running around saying ug and whacking things over the head and things like that is just not true. I could stand here and preach for two hours about what's wrong with the theory of evolution, but this is just one little snapshot of what they found when they started um, excavating that land. They found medical records. They found medical records of how you treat a patient after brain surgery. This is 6,000 years ago. This is not, I mean, I understand we have technology now that they have, but these people weren't dummies. They just, they had indoor bathtubs. They were a very civilized society. They were also, unfortunately, a very pagan um, culture. In fact, Abraham's father was an idol maker. And if you want to go anywhere else in the Bible to uh, reference these things, Joshua 24, I think verse 2, talks about Abraham's family being pagan idolaters. Now, here's the other problem. Um, if you were brought up in any, any sort of an idolatry-based, you know, worshiping idols lifestyle, tell me, when would a God have ever talked to you? Now, this is the first time that this ever happened. This is the first time that, um, you know, when, when God appeared to Abraham, all the worshiping of idols they did, when did one of them ever answer him? Now, all of a sudden, this God shows up and says, hey, you know, uh, I got these plans for you. I mean, whoa. You know, that must have been really... I know for me, and I grew up knowing about God, but when I got saved and I asked the Lord into my life, my first reaction was, whoa, what is that? And I didn't know what it meant to be born again. I didn't know he was going to give me his Holy Spirit. I'm sitting there at work, and the guy sitting next to me is looking at me going, hey, you did this, didn't you? And I'm like, how did you know that? Because I didn't say anything to anybody. I was praying silently. I mean, it's really quite an experience. But now think of this. Now he has to go explain to his family, hey, listen, I'm leaving, okay? Um, God appeared to me. We get this all wrong. And we're going to go travel to this other country where the Canaanites live. And the Canaanites were no uh, nice people either. I mean, if you do any research about them. They were a very vile, disgusting, pagan society. So they weren't exactly leaving one really good life and heading into another one. They really didn't know very much about where they were heading. Now imagine him telling them this. He said, well, what, you know, Abraham, what are you, what are you talking about? What do you mean God appeared to you? Which, which one? No, we get it all wrong. There's only one God. Oh, really? Now, if you want any example in my life of you know, what, that, what that's like. I remember shortly after I got saved, Laurie had, had been saved about a month, and God, and God started speaking to me about something, and I was like, I can't tell her this. I can't. How do I go to my wife and say, okay, look, you know, Laurie, the Lord spoke to me today, and this is what he wants us to do. And the, the message he gave me was, I want you to get out of debt in the next year. And I remember when I first heard that, I said, I must have heard this wrong because I was in no position to, to do that. So over the next week, every time I would get on my knees to pray, God would impress this on my heart. So finally I said, all right, Lord, how? So he laid out this 
plan right in my mind, not that I was hearing voices, but it was pretty clear, except for there was one little thing left off, and there was no allowance for food. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And now I know my wife's been saved a month, and now i got to go explain to her, this is what the Lord's telling me to do. She's going to say, get out. Get out. I mean, we can't possibly bear this. I turned around, and I looked over at her, and I said, all right, well, I'm going to do it, but I don't know how this is going to go over. At that time, her job would have paid her, it could have been $20 one week, it could have been 150 the next week. We had no idea what her paycheck would be from one week to the, to the next. And when I went and explained it to her, she's like, you're kidding me. I said, no, I, she said, Jim, we're just getting by as it is. I said, I know, but you know, this is the plan that, you know, we have. And so she says, well, what about the food? I says, well, you're going to have to provide that. She says, well, my check could be anywhere from 20 to 150. And I said, we're praying for the 150. I mean, I didn't know anything else to tell her. This was all new to me. I mean, I hadn't been saved more than a few months. I had just started going to church. She just got saved. This was really, really hard. You know, how do you explain to all your family uh, your extended family, all these crazy things going on in your life. You know, what do you mean you're not going to do these things anymore? What do you mean you're not going to go to those places anymore? Well, I just don't think a, a Christian ought, ought to be acting that way. Of course, they're all telling me they're Christians, which they're not. They're, and they're telling me that because they claim to be Christians and they do these things, therefore I should think it's okay. You know, I say all that just to say, what do you think Abraham's going through as he gets these directions from God? And now he has to explain to his family, I'm going to be leaving. Okay? Another thing is, Abraham wasn't supposed to bring anybody with him, except for his wife. Um, his father went along with him. His uh, nephew Lot went, went along with him. And if you want any confirmation of that, you can go reference the book of Isaiah. The, Bi the book of Isaiah says, and I'm sorry, on the top of my head, I don't have the chapter and verse, but... Isaiah wrote that God spoke to, I, to Abraham alone. The calling was not for Abraham to pack up his things and go. It was for Abraham to get up and leave your, your country and your kindred. Get away from the pagans is what God was saying. Now, how do you explain that to people that have never heard from, from God ever? Go read the story of Elijah. Elijah gave the idolaters in his time, an opportunity to prove. Okay, you build an altar and I'll build one. You pray to your God, I'll pray to mine. Whoever answers by fire, he's God. These people went crazy trying to get some sort of an answer to prayer. They were jumping up and down on top of the altar. They were cutting themselves. They were just going mental. What did Elijah do? He bowed his head, or he looked up to heaven, he raised his hands and he prayed. And that was all he did. No theatrics, no getting out of control, no flopping himself on the ground. He just prayed to the Lord and fire came down and devoured the whole thing. So that God is now trying to introduce to Abraham who he is, give him instructions. And he's telling him that he's got a plan for his life. And it's going to involve a place that he's never been to before. So what happens? Well, they, they never got out of there. Uh, home country. They went from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran, stayed there a long time. Now you say, someone said to me recently, that's only partial, di partial disobedience. And I said, well, you're going to find out in chapter 13 what partial disobedience means in God's eyes. I'll give you one, again, another reference. When God told Moses to speak to the rock, Moses hit the rock. What did God say? Okay, I'll give you the water, but you're not going to the promised land. That's it. So what does partial disobedience mean in God's eyes? It means there's a problem that has to be corrected. He doesn't deal with every person the same way, but he doesn't let it go. Okay? So finally, Abraham's father dies. You see? Now he moves on. Problem is, he still has Lot with him. Lot was not supposed to be with him. Somewhere along the line, Lot became a believer. I don't know when that happened. I don't know if it was at the beginning or somewhere along that journey, but I'm sure that Lot was not supposed to be there. And then again, in a conversation, someone said to me, yeah, but he, if, if he's a believer, it's okay. 
No, the book of Isaiah says God spoke to Abram alone. He said, get away from your kindred. Get out of your country. Go to the place I'm going to tell you. I'll show you then what's going to go on. Lot tags along. That's going to present a lot of problems. Lot is going to cause a lot of problems. But they finally, finally leave Haran. And in chapter 12, they end up going to, to the place that God told them. And there was, there was a, um, a, a, I lost me. There was no water. There was no food. There was no, you couldn't grow anything. It was, um, I can't think of the word. It, yeah, yes, it, it was barren, but that's not the word I'm looking for. But anyway, he, um, he goes there and he says, this is no good. And now imagine the confusion that's causing him. Now, wait a minute. You know, I'm doing what God told me to do. I get to the place I'm supposed to go. And this is what's going on. So he takes off and goes to Egypt. Now, that's a problem that a lot of Christians have is when things start going wrong, they go back to the world. If you read the Bible, you will find that any references to Egypt usually represents the world. Okay, we don't need to go back into the world. The examples that you need for that, read the Bible. It just never works out. Or ask me, I'll tell you how it, how it works out. Uh, I backslid one, at, at one point and, and my Christian friend warned me that God wouldn't let me get away with it and I ended up in jail. I sat in that jail cell and I said, I get it. And the Lord said, no, you don't. There was going to be another time that I was going to have to bang my head on the wall before I was going to finally realize that Christianity is not living with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. It's just never going to work out. And we're always going to be sacrificing something along the way. It's, we're going to be delaying God's blessings or we're going to be forfeiting God's blessings. And I'm not saying that he just turns his back on us, I'm, you know, but whatever God's plans were for us are all being stalled. Abraham's plans were being stalled in Haran. Now they're being stalled again because he walks right through the promised land and he goes to Egypt. And what happens there? Well, just what happens when you start eyeballing the world and trying to compromise your faith, he lies and says uh, Sarah is his sister, which technically she was his half-sister, but that was a half-truth is a lie because he didn't tell Pharaoh that that was his wife. So Pharaoh thought, well, you know, she's, she's beautiful and, um, you know, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take her to be my wife. And so he started showering Abraham with all these gifts. And he say, wow, blessings are coming. No, listen, the measure of God's blessings is not always prosperity. You know, it's not how much money you have in the bank. I hear people say that all the time. And listen, I'm no different. I... I read the promises of God, and I want to obey God, and I want God to bless me. You know, I don't want to be going through a hassle every, every other week trying to figure out how I'm going to pay the bills and all this other stuff. But let me just tell you something. It's in those desert experiences that you find out more about God than you ever find on the mountaintop. And Abraham, he's learning, but he hasn't figured it out yet. So he goes through. He ends up in Egypt. He lies. Okay, well, why was he lying? Well, you need to understand that even though these were pagan societies, they understood the penalty of adultery. Now, for example, I think it, I think it was in Syria, if a woman was caught in adultery, they would cut her nose off, and she'd have to walk around the rest of her life with basically two holes in her face. That's kind of like, you know, you see that a couple times, and you go, <laughs> you know, these, these people were figuring out on their own that this was a really bad thing to be doing. In another country, I forget, I don't know if it was Egypt or some other country, it's, they would basically take the two people that were caught in adultery and tie them together and drown them. You know what I mean? So Abraham knows in Egypt, one of the things that they will do, and listen, thousands of years later, they found records of this. If they want that woman and she's married, they'll kill the husband and take the woman. Oh, it's not adultery now. You know what I mean? This is what he was afraid of. Again, you got to put yourself in his shoes and say, what's he looking at? Okay, he's afraid because he's got all these flocks and herds and people with him. He's afraid to stay where there's no water, no food. 
So he figures, okay, I'll go to Egypt. It was common in those days for people to go to Egypt when there was a famine. That was the word I was looking for. I'm sorry. I'm brain dead. Um, It was common because Egypt was known to have a constant supply of water and food. Okay, so this was, you know, he wasn't doing something that was so out of the ordinary. But it was not what God wanted him to do. He didn't stay there five minutes to find out what God had for him. So he went to Egypt. Um, he lied about his about Sarah being his wife, said it was his sister. Pharaoh tried to take her, and now all of a sudden God starts inflicting Pharaoh with plagues. Pharaoh comes out and starts ripping him apart. He's like, you know, what did I do? I treated you good, and you, and you lied to me, and you almost cost me my whole kingdom. It's not a good thing when a believer gets chastised by unbelievers. This is really not good. Can you imagine what he's saying to him? You know the living God. You're supposed to be a believer, and this is how you treated me. This is a bad testimony, okay? You know what else it is? It's another building block in his learning experience to finding out what God's expecting of him. So he goes back. He, he, he leaves Egypt, and he goes back to where he was supposed to be in the first place. More tests are coming. And that's where we're going to pick the story up. Um, Remember now, he still has Lot with him. And remember all that I just said. He did not obey God. God said, leave the country. And he went to, actually, Haran is actually still in the same country that he was. So he he left the city, but did not leave that country. And if you're not sure where Ur the Chaldees is, it's basically Monday, Iraq. So next time you look on your map, you can say, wow, Abraham's from Iraq. Yes, that was supposed to be part of the promised land. That was another act of disobedience on the part of Israel. But we'll stick with the story here for now. Um, <clears throat> so Abraham, uh, Abram leaves Egypt. He goes back where, where, where he's supposed to be. But now remember, Pharaoh has piled on him camels and sheep and anything I mean, gold and silver. And so at one point it says that, you know, you know the old expression, Your cup run, my, my cup runneth over? His was running over. He had more than he could handle. And when he gets back to the promised land, there's going to be a problem because of that, because now Lot and Abram's herds are going to start fighting with each other. And that's where we're going to pick the story up in uh, chapter 13. And it says, And Abram went out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So his first time through, he had built an altar When he realized he messed up, what did he do? This is what every one of us should do. Go back where you came from. Go back where you went wrong. I told you the story when I I backslid, my wife was, you know, not going to have any of the nonsense that I was, uh, I was going back. I was going back where I was before I got saved and it was going to cause a lot of problems. Uh, I was about to get thrown out of my house, actually, because it was just that bad. And uh, I went to my pastor, and the pastor said, you know, th- this is just amazing. He said, I, when I heard what happened, I was all ready to counsel you, but you've already done it. You've already pronounced yourself guilty. You've, you've pronounced the sentence, and you've already <laughs> made it all right. He says, what is it you want me to do for you? And I said, well, at the very least, I want someone to know. I need to be accountable for my actions, and I need, to, I need someone to know that, you know, I'm not intentionally trying to play games with God here. It's just, you know, it was bad choices is all it was. It was bad choices. I did what Abraham did. I got saved and I didn't leave the pagans, if you will. You know, yet, I mean, do I not care about my friends anymore? No, but I can't hang around with them anymore because even though it's not their fault, the choices I make, there's going to be an influence. We're all influenced by somebody. And the day I finally, it, it had to happen twice, I told my friends, don't, don't call me anymore unless it's on a Saturday afternoon and it has something to do with not doing what we normally did. And um, sometimes I share what some of those things were and sometimes it's hard to, and right now I don't think I have the time to do it, but um, 
Abraham at least had the wherewithal to go back to where he built the altar and worship the Lord. He's going to try to make things right. He's, he's trying to learn this process. He's trying to figure out what he's supposed to be doing. Verse 5 says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt in the land. And remember, those people were not very pleasant people either. And Abraham said unto Lot, let there be no strife. Now listen to this. You talk about someone, you look for signs. <laughs> you know, some people misunderstand this and they'll say, you have no right to judge someone. Listen, when I, when I say what I'm about to say, it's not for the purpose of judging. It's because you care about someone and you're looking to see, is there any sign that they're starting to get it? They're starting to walk up right before the Lord. They're starting to you know, show fruit in their life. It's not so that we can just go over and take the Bible and beat them over the head with it and say, oh, fault. Oh, I saw you did something wrong, you know. But as you read this story, you start to see the mistakes, but then you start to see the evidence that, okay, he's learning. He's getting it, right? So now they come back, and this is the penalty. Now, first of all, Lot's not supposed to be with them. They weren't supposed to be in Egypt. Now, because they went to Egypt, they have too much. And they're bumping into each other. And there's a fight going on. Abraham's response. Now listen, strife is not the problem, but it's how you handle it. Okay? Uh, Barnabas and Paul had a, had a fight over um, John Mark. You know, Paul said he's not fit to go on this missionary trip. And Barnabas said, no, yeah, we, you know, we need to use him. Well, God allowed that strife and he formed two missionary teams out of it. And later on, uh, Paul sent for John Mark and said, send John Mark, he's, he'll, he'll be helpful to me in whatever he was trying, trying to do at that time. It's not that the strife is the problem, but it's how you handle it. I've seen people cause a problem because they walked in, the, not in this church, <laughs> walk in the church and somebody was sitting in their seat. I saw one guy stand in the middle aisle because somebody was in his seat, stand there like this, staring at the person for several minutes, and I'm sitting in the back, I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I don't even believe what I'm seeing. I understand that we're creatures of habit, and we like to have our place. I mean, I get all that. That's not a sin. But, I mean, what if that was a brand new Christian? What if that was someone that just got saved and just hadn't been around long enough to know that that was my seat? You know what I mean? Maybe I should let them have the seat and try to get here a little early next week to make sure I get my seat. Why am I going to stand in the middle of the church? Oh, my goodness. I mean, the things that people, again, not here, but the things that people have caused problems over in, in church is just un, unbelievable. I mean, again, I don't put myself on any pedestal, but... You know, at some point, they're just, you know, if you're saved long enough, there just has to be something more important than the petty little things that we can strive over. You know what I mean? So Abraham, he's, he's now getting that. And um, he, he doesn't want... Now, remember, there's unbelievers watching, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I have a feeling when Abram saw Pharaoh's response to what he was doing, he now started realizing, you know, we have to represent the Lord right before the unbelievers. So his response is, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. It's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So he's giving him first choice. Abraham is learning to let go. Lot is learning to take hold of the things of the world. And you're going to find out why. In that comment that I made about the influence, it's not just people, but it's places we go. Things will start to rub off on us. And if someone says to me, what are you, you know, you're one of those brainwashed Christians, I'm going to say, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm brainwashed, and this is where I went to get brainwashed. Who brainwashed you? Because we're learning and being influenced by something all the time. So he's starting to understand that, you know, maybe what I think is the best thing is not the best thing. Maybe I need to honor the Lord first, and God will provide. After all, he's blessed me pretty good so far. Maybe I need to trust him. 
So verse 10 says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. And in parentheses, you notice it says, Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Obviously, it wasn't well watered after that fire came down. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoah. So you see what Lot's looking at? He didn't talk about the garden in the sense that, you know, uh, Adam met face to face with God in the cool of the day, which is what it says back in the beginning of Genesis. Lot's talking about the garden itself. So that's like saying, what can I get out of this? You know what I'm saying? I bet you if you asked Abraham, you know, what do you think about the garden of Eden? He probably would have mentioned the fact that Adam got to meet with God face to face every day. Lot they just come out of Egypt, and he says, you know something? This looks a lot like that. I want it. Okay? But what's happening here is God is finally accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish in the, in the, in the very beginning, which is he said to Abram, get away from your country and your kindred. So now Abraham and Lot are going to separate. Okay? That is so important because they're going to separate, but he's not going away yet. There's going to be more problems later. It says, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain. And get this, pitched his tent toward Sodom. What that means is he's not in Sodom, but he's pitched his tent towards Sodom so that every morning he, he wakes up and he walks out that front door of his tent, he's looking right at Sodom. Some commentators, some scholars believe that the first time through, they got a glimpse of the evil that was going on there. And there's a book that I have to get. Um, I, I mean, I have to get this book. I want to know what this guy was talking about, but supposedly he's an expert on demonology. And his claim is there was a lot worse going on in Sodom and Gomorrah than just homosexuality. Now, that would be bad enough in, you know, in God's eyes, but some of them think that there was a lot of other reasons. You know, Abraham, even if Lot had chosen not to go to Sodom, Abraham wouldn't have gone there. That's what a lot of them are saying. I didn't have enough time to go find out where, why they thought that, or, but, um, it's a bad place, and he's now got his eyes fixed on it. You're going to find out later on that he ends up in Sodom. Then you're going to find out later on that he's one of the governors of, of Sodom. He's in a position of authority. And what is that going to cost him? Oh, my goodness. It's just going to, you know, his, his, he brought, he won no one to the, to the Lord. His witness was, was gone. I mean, he, you know, um, Peter wrote about righteous Lot's soul being vexed by uh by the by the lifestyle there after the, he got rescued and they left there when god was going to destroy sodom and gomorrah you see his only his two daughters and ended up out with him their husbands didn't make it his wife didn't make it and then his daughters got him drunk and um and got pregnant by it by him and you see this was no problem for them because the lifestyle that they were around every single day they saw this disgusting lifestyle. It was like no big deal. So we had to be careful the the choices we, we make. Yeah, you know, go someplace and witness to someone. Absolutely. I pretty much, there's no part of my unsaved life that's that's left. I mean, I don't even know if my friends think I'm their friend anymore, but I try to remind them that I still am. I care about them, but I just can't do what they do and be where they are and I can't compromise my Christian life. But the story ends up pretty good here. And the Lord said unto Abram, verse 14, oh, verse 13 says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So there is the statement that God makes about his choice. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. When did God show him? When did God fulfill the promise to say, now I'm going to show you? It was after 
his family was gone. What did, what did God say in the beginning? Get away from your kindred, get away from your country. In the beginning, he didn't get out of the country. He stopped in Haran. One guy said he was there for 70 years, but I, I couldn't do the math. You know, okay, you said he was 75 years old at this point when he journeyed out. Then you said he stayed there for 70 years. Well, that would make him 140. Again, I just couldn't keep digging up more and more information. We'd be here until noontime. But um, it was when finally Lot separated from him that God said, now lift up now thine eyes. Now that word now, this is an interesting thing. Um, the word now really, the literal translation is please. And one commentator said, the translators didn't know what to do with it. How could the God that is the creator of everything be, be talking to a sinner saying please? I don't personally have a problem understanding that at all. I don't have any pro- I've heard it since the day I got saved. I've heard preachers say God is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on anybody. He's, um, and I don't think it's a please as in begging. I think it would be if, you know, if uh, if there was a woman standing there at the back door and, and, and her husband was at war in Afghanistan for years and she didn't know he was back and all of a sudden I saw him standing behind her and I said, please turn around, please. <laughs> you know, because I just want her to turn around and see him standing there, you know what I mean? So, oh, my husband's back, you know. Um, I, you know, he, but he says to Abram, please lift up, please thine eyes and look from the place where you are. Now you notice he didn't say, look where you are. He said, look from where you are. This is everything that you read from chapter 10 up until now is leading to this point. God is trying to establish, there is no Jewish religion yet. There is no, you know, he's trying to start something new here. Now, mind you, back at the time that Abraham first come, comes on the scene, Babylon is now starting to take form. In the background somewhere, Job was out there. Remember, Job is older than Abraham. And even though he's not mentioned until the book of Job, but he's out there. And Job understood uh, offering sacrifices to, to God and uh, you know, that uh, without the shedding of blood, there's, there's, there's no remission of sin. So these pagans, there was a witness out there. there. There was some way that they could have known all these things that God's trying to do. But for some reason, God, instead of picking righteous Job to start all this, he takes a guy that's so far removed from, you know, anything that has to do with Jehovah, And he says, now I'm going to show you a new thing. The first thing he's teaching him is obedience. The second thing he's going to teach him right now is, okay, now that all these things are in place that I told you, now I'm going to show you. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be looking from where we are to where are we going. That's what we're supposed to be doing. When strife comes in our life, are we supposed to start grabbing hold and saying, mine Or are we supposed to do what Abraham says and says, hey, listen, let there be no strife between us. We're brothers. We're brothers. I I could give you example after example how God has blessed when someone has tried to start trouble with me. My my wife was furious with, with me a few times. She goes, you're being a doormat. No, I'm not. Well, what are you doing? I'm trying to honor the Lord. I'm trying. I mean, am I perfect at it? No. Do I blow it? Yes. But here was an opportunity where somebody was making a big thing out of nothing. And I was like, fine, have your way. Have it. Now, I don't want to tell you about the 6,500 times I didn't exactly get it right. But, you know, the idea is that we don't want people to see. Well, I'll tell you, there was this one place I worked at where um, it was owned by Mormons. Um there was a guy reading the satanic Bible in, in God's Bible, side by side, didn't understand why he was so confused. I said, I think I can explain why you're confused. Um, and every time I would witness, I'd get these four or five guys together to witness, this kid that was from a Pentecostal church would run over and start yelling, you're not speaking in tongues. 
I don't know how you expect an unsaved person to speak in tongues. I just don't get that. I mean, you want someone spiritually dead to exercise a spiritual gift. I don't think that works. I think he, his problem was, I don't know if he was taught that. I think his zeal got the better of him. But I finally pulled him aside and I said, listen, whose side are you on? Do you understand what you're doing here? You, every time you come over and do this, these guys start laughing and walk away and you blow the whole thing. And then I had to explain to him that, you know, everything you're saying is wrong. Well, believe me, his heart was broken. God opened his eyes and he, he realized what he was doing. And I said, listen, don't ever confront another Christian in front of unbelievers. Don't do it. It's hard enough to witness to them. They, they have enough things to point their finger at. All the confusion that goes on with all the denominations. And listen, the church I spent 15 years in wouldn't talk to any of you. You are beneath them. You understand? This is what goes on in Christianity. I couldn't go along with that. Every time I would meet a Christian, if they told me they were saved, my heart would be leaping for joy. But I would go to church, and then there would be the pastor standing there saying, oh, you, know, you should have nothing to do with them. Have, and, and the verses he would quote, have no part of the unfruitful works of darkness. I said, my goodness, I thought we were talking about a different church. Not in his eyes. No, if you weren't part of that denomination, you, were, you, you might be saved, but you were way down here and you were way out there. I just couldn't stand that stuff. I mean, that just drove me absolutely crazy. And I tried to be a good little, you know, whatever they're supposed to be. And then I would go meet somebody and I would be like, oh my goodness, I, I, you know, I'm talking to a brother. I couldn't help it. It was from inside. It was the Holy Spirit was teaching me one thing and that guy was teaching me a different thing. We don't want to be, be showing that. So anyway, I'm going to wrap this right now. I'm just going to say that the, the one thing that God spoke to me the loudest about and what all this, what I wanted all this to, to lead to is this, that sometimes in the, when, when your life comes to a place that you feel so stressed out, you know, uh, whether it's from re, um, fi financial things or relational things or whatever it might be, even if it's something in the church. I mean, things can go wrong. We're all, we're all human and we're all sinners. At some point, I think God wants us to stop and look up from where we are. If I look up from where, where, where I am, I can't believe I can't believe where, where God brought me. And there was a point in my life that I thought that when I came to this church, I thought God was done with me. And you notice that when Abraham finally got it right, God didn't sit there and say, you know, Abraham, I had these big plans for you, but no, you had to go back to Egypt and you had to do this, that, and the other thing. There was no mention of it. In Hebrews 11, when Abraham's name is mentioned, there's no mention of his blunders. God is so merciful and full of grace. And if somebody comes here to this church that is, has been away from the Lord, whether it's a few months or a few years, and they say, I was saved when I was younger and I want to come back to the Lord, all we want to say is welcome back and put our arms around them and love them. Because that's what God does. When I, when I came here and I decided to start serving, I thought I was going to be standing at the door ushering for the rest of my life. And that's not a bad thing either. I was very happy that I had that opportunity to start serving. And uh, I never thought I would stand behind the pulpit again. I never thought I would ever do a Bible study. I, I never thought... I mean, I was so down, broken and beaten down. I couldn't imagine that God could have anything more planned for my life. And I'll never forget the day he said, Jim, get up. Let's go. I said, no, Lord, I'll, I'll screw it up. Satan is such a liar. No, again, I don't consider it any low thing. If, if, if they had just kept me at the door shaking people's hands, I was glad to be serving the Lord. 
I never used any ministry in this church as any stepping stone to go anywhere else but where I was. I was very happy to be right there doing just that. Because standing at the door, there's opportunities to minister to people. That's why they don't let me do it anymore, because I was blocking the door. People couldn't get in the door. But I, I say all that just to say that God is so merciful and so, so full of grace. But when those problems come up in our life, do we ever stop and look at the Lord and look at eternity? Do you understand that this life is not it? This is not the end of the line. We don't need to be grabbing everything. Oh, you know, it's just mine. You know, I can't let go of anything and I can't forgive anything. I can't forgive that person because it hurts too much. I know. Listen, my life's verse, and I'm going to close on this. You can go read it ahead yourself. Is Genesis 15:1, where I swore I would never have a life's verse. I didn't understand why people did it. And they all had the same ones. And God put that on my heart one day like a ton of bricks. And where, where God said to me, I am thy shield and thy great and exceeding reward. And every once in a while, I need to stop and God needs, needs to remind me because like everybody else, you get distracted. And the unimportant things become important. You forget the important things. Abraham is a great example of every... There's one person I really wish was here. Has not been saved very, very long and is struggling with, with, with uh, some of these things. And listen, this isn't the end of it for him. He still botches it again. His life, if you were to, to put it on the chart, goes like this. He's not perfect. And we should take comfort that he's not. God took such an imperfect person and said, you know, uh, I'm going to use you for such great things. Uh, one person said, you know, why didn't God just make Moses Pharaoh instead of putting Egypt through all that that he did in that Exodus story? Why didn't God make Job uh, fill, fill the role of Abraham? I don't know why. But the Bible says that God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And he doesn't always pick the, the smartest person or the best looking person. Perfect example of standing right <laughs> But uh, he does have plans for every one of our lives, and we need to make sure we don't let Satan throw too, too many roadblocks in front of us and trip us. And if we fall, we got to get up. And we got to know that God is faithful. I mean, uh, you know, he's not going to sit there and say, oh, you messed up. You know, what is my resume going to look like now? I picked you to do this job, and you screwed it up. Now I'm going to, okay, you can get the second place prize, I, I, but I'm going to have to go with, with, with someone else that's better than you. No. No, he's going to continue that plan that he has for your life. And how fast you get to where he wants you to go depends on how much we cooperate with him.